time. It's amazing. So, welcome to Mac Attack. I changed the name because I like Mac Attack better. It was black box forensics, but same difference. Um, I wanted to do a talk on Macs because they've been coming up more and more. We used to never see them. The only people that had Macs were security people, uh, people in marketing, arts. There were very few of them around. Some schools, they crop up in schools. Um, but now, everybody's got Macs. They're all over the place. Um, and that's why I thought that a talk would be appropriate so that we could look at how things work, how they boot, and how things get erased. Are they better than PCs for security? Are they worse? How difficult is it? I'm not going to leave the podium because I have to see my speaker's notes. Yes, technology works. I love it. So this is who I am, why I'm here. Um, Brian Martin, the name's in there, big deal. I own Liticode, which is a forensics and security consulting company. We're lots of fun. Um, I've been doing this for an awful long time. I've probably forgotten more than most people need to learn to do the job um, between programming, sysop stuff, and all the rest. So in addition to uh, all of that, of course, we have to have the traditional declaimer. We're just going to get through these first few slides, and then we'll get rocking. The most important thing to take away from here, other than I deny all responsibility for everything, is um, this part right here. If you forensicate, consider this is just one of many guideposts. Stuff changes. So even as I was going through and building this, things were changing, especially um, with the latest release of the OS. But things are constantly in motion. Uh, I don't think I've had a case yet where I didn't have to go and dig something new out of the woodwork to figure out how to ask questions. Um, anybody in here is already a skilled OSX forensicator? Oh, you're going to be bored. More stories, though. OK. Um, and we'll see how good my timing is this year. Last year, I had to rush through this stuff. Another takeaway from this, when we're talking about all these tools, go and get training, uh, professional training. YouTube's great, but if you try and run a production shop on YouTube videos and what you figured out from uh, Blacklight, it's going to cause you a world of grief. So use professional tools, get professional training, work for a company that will pay for all of that for you, get very good at it, and then spin off your own company. And then, you know, what is it? Um, cash checks or whatever the saying is. Make bank, whatever. Uh, there's a ton of work out there. There's a ton of work. We are always behind. There's always stuff falling down. There's no competition whatsoever. There's three people in the Lehigh Valley that do this. And I have never run into them on any job. Um, we work pretty much everywhere. But literally, this is a great field to be in, especially since it crosses into uh, security with red, hat and red team and blue team, black hat. So good career choice, those of you that are here for the forensic stuff. And if you're in business, we'll talk. Um, if you're going to use X-Ways, which is a phenomenal tool, but extremely painful, you really need to blow the $800 for the training class if you want to get up and running quickly. You can probably figure it out. You're all smart. But there are things X-Way does in strange ways that are painful to learn. And the, uh, the book is not adequate, although the course does cover the book material. So enough pitching for other vendor stuff. Um, why did I decide to do this? I've had a couple bad experiences over the years. Between the lack of coaching, the lack of professional advice, um, dialogue, and a distinct lack of research materials, I thought maybe we should throw a talk together and just cover the basics in the hopes that you guys would then go out and do some very specific detail-oriented talks. There are a couple things out there. Um, in particular, there's a, well, we're going to list it later, but there's, some good, there's a couple good talks now. It used to be a wasteland. This used to be a very difficult field, uh, OSX. But it's gotten better. There are some better books out there. If you're going to work in OSX with OSX Forensics, read them all until you think that you're not reading anything new anymore. Because uh, they all seem to have a little something extra to offer. And after you've read the first one, you can get through the rest of them real quick. 
So we're going to talk about not only OSX, but the problems that we've encountered going through the years with this. And uh, like I said, the war stories are going to be fun, but we're not going to dwell on them. There is technical material in this talk. If you do not know, who here knows how to use command line operations, DOS, anything? Anybody not know command line stuff? Okay. We, if, if we come to hard parts, don't worry about it. No tests after this. Um, so the funny story intro here is that I get a call from a guy who I trust. I should just stay there, huh? And he says, can you image a Mac for me? And if you understand the business, um, you know that there's more to this than just imaging the Mac. You know, nobody hands you a book and says, image this, thank you very much, here's your money. It's image this and then do operations on it. Uh, but he says he's in a bind and he needs the thing imaged right away and uh, can he send it out? I say, yeah, sure, no problem, you're a friend. I'll image it, no big deal. So he sends it out to me and we image it. it takes us about two hours because uh, it's a 500 gig hard drive. And then we call him up to see what he wants done with it. And he's like, you're done? I'm like, yeah, why? Well, because the FBI had it for two weeks and they couldn't get it imaged. What do you mean the FBI had it for two weeks? Well, this guy that we hired, who's from the FBI, had it for two weeks, and he couldn't figure out how to get it imaged. I'm like, I'm like my, my brain is melting. If you know OSX at all, if you know Macintosh uh, books, you know that copying that hard drive is built into the OS, right? It's built in. It's not you know, as easy as booting it up and doing a Word document, but it's not terribly difficult. It's something that anybody who says, I'm an FBI agent and I know forensic, they should be able to pull that one off. That's not hard. Okay. So don't claim you can do it if you can't. If someone's offering you a job to do in forensics and you don't have the skills, don't, don't offer to do it. The second thing is, uh, or third thing is get paid in advance. The other two are supposed to, you're already supposed to know, right? Don't alter the evidence. Which brings us to the funny part of the story. So he asks us to do some processing on it. And we start going through it and digging out. And that's why the talk is called Black Bag Forensics because he won't tell us what we're looking for. I'm like, do you have anything that you can give us? And he's like, yeah, they were doing something in AWS and they crashed a bunch of servers in the cloud. Okay, so why did you give me a MacBook? Well, because we think they did it from there. Ah, okay, so this, and this is going back and forth over a period of days here because he's got to go to the client and ask them questions and then he's got to come back. And this all started with, will you image this Mac? And now we're talking AWS which is a whole nother ball of wax. Um, so we start digging through it, and eventually it dawns on me that the timeline that we're looking for activity in doesn't match the timeline of activity on the disk. So I map it all out, and I call him back up, and I'm like, you said you guys took possession of this on the 13th. Yeah. I got it on the 19th, uh -huh. or something like that. It was two weeks lapsed between when they got it and when I got it. Why is there activity in between when nobody should have had this thing? I don't know. Let me find out. So he calls me back and he's like, yeah, the FBI guy turned it on so he could see if he could copy the disk. <sighs> back to rule number one, right? Don't change. You work in forensics and you don't understand that. So I'll take a short segue from that talk to talk about another thing, a similar issue. And you're going to come across this stuff all the time. The last tech that I had, who I no longer have, was sent out into the field to collect a drive. And we don't send them out uninitiated, right? We tell them how to do the job. We train them. We get them to understand, go through the process. You know what you're doing. He imaged the drive, and then he turned it back on so he could copy the host name which, of course, you could have gotten from the image, or you could have just asked somebody in the organization. But so this stuff happens. It happens all the time. Luckily, I was smart enough not to send them out on a job that it mattered, because you'll learn that lesson, too. Know your risks. Risk management is a part of everything. That was part of my risk. Thankfully, I managed it well that time, and we didn't hurt anything. But things like that happen. So here we have super FBI guy, intern. Uh, I got two calls last week for incident response on virus stuff. In both cases, they called us after they had tried to fix it themselves, 
after they knew that the machines were infected, after they knew that they probably had a PHI exposure, they tried to work on it themselves, and then they called us. You have an incident response policy that says, step one, call the forensics guys. We have them on contract. You're paying us money. Call us. No, no, we'll fix it ourselves. Sure you will. <clears throat> so when you turn a Mac on, one of the key things that it does, and this is one of the most important things you're here in this course today for, is if it's been sitting for any, any length of time, like two weeks, and you turn it on, anybody know what's going to happen? And this is a combination of BSD and Apple. It's going to roll the logs because they are more than a week old. And do you know what happens on a Unix system when you roll logs? The old files are no longer there. If you happen to catch it at that very moment, you might be able to recover that data from disk because OSX, BSD, Linux don't operate like Windows. What does Windows do with files that you've deleted? Leaves them there? What else does it do? Yeah, and it leaves them there for as long as it can. It will intentionally avoid those areas of the disk until it has used up all the blank disk space. It will avoid them, they'll still be there, which is why years after somebody has done something on a PC with Windows, you can go in and get everything they did on it because those files are all still there. Not with OS X or Linux or Unix. When it rolls files, that space becomes immediately available and the OS will use it when it feels like it, which is usually pretty darn quick because there's so much going on these days, which is why it's so critical not to turn something on if it's off or to leave something on if it's running because you can't get that memory forensic stuff if they turn it off. That's happened twice this week with the people who called us, hey, can you work on this? Yeah. Ah, I forgot I had a slide for this. That's Tom Hanks uh, from the movie. Houston, we have a problem. Yeah, we have a big problem. So the case that we're working on, now that the system logs have rolled, there's not a whole lot I can do. There's some material on the box, but because, because the forensic examination team changed the evidence, there's no way we're going after this guy for criminal behavior. So they totally shot themselves in the foot with that one. It happens. That's the risk. If it had been me that would do that, you could then sue me. That's why we have malpractice insurance, so that when we screw up, you can sue us and you get money. Luckily, it wasn't me. It was them. Um, and I think the company that sourced the whole problem was so embarrassed by the whole thing that they just shut it down, and that was the end of that. SpongeBob. The memes are in there to keep you awake. The pictures, I know, because some of this stuff is really dry. Um, so, bonus points if you know the full origin of memes that get thrown up there and you're like, hey, it's not. Um, approach each case that you're working on with a very defined target. The problem with black box forensics and not knowing what you're looking for is that these things are so bloody big these days and there's so many different areas that, to look in that if you can't focus on a particular area, you're going to waste a lot of the client's money. So it's very important to figure out what it is you're trying to find, talk to the client, get specifics. Usually it's very simple. They come to you and they're like, this guy was doing bad stuff. What kind of bad stuff? The stuff to do with pictures. Okay, I know what to look for now. The stuff to do with intellectual property. What intellectual property? We can't tell you. I can't work on it then, because you have to give me something to go on. Uh, if I'm going to find it anyways, you might as well tell me. It, lawyers do strange things. Companies do strange things. It's your job as the person doing the forensics to work with them, use your social engineering skills to get them to cough up whatever information you need to put a firm, solid fence around your goals. <clears throat> The surest way to pain and suffering on your project is to scope it incorrectly. Um, for example, let's take the image problem. The way the state police, the way the attorney general, um, the way the people that process CP picture problems is uh, a very narrow defined set of operations. They know what they're looking for. They go in and they find it and they're done. 
they have their case, they have their evidence, they're done. There's no extenuating circumstances, there's no um, other descriptive activities on the system that are going to help the client from their perspective. So if you have a defense um, attorney come to you and ask you to help defend his client in a CP case, one of the things you're going to find that there's a, a certain set of things that they'll always ask for. One of the things that they're going to ask you to do is show that this was not his primary interest. Or her. Could be her. It's never her. Um, if you're downloading entire servers of illicit material, you may in fact accidentally down something that's illegal. That could happen, and that would generally be a valid excuse. But when your entire cache of search terms is pretty extensive uh, and exclusive to a particular type of image, then you're pretty much done for. But it pays, even if you don't have a defense that you can mount. But if you don't have that, no, wait, 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 so that they have their scope and we had our scope, and we went in looking for things that were not CP, and we didn't find any. So that was, that was the end of that case. That was short, no testimony. Please settle immediately for whatever they're offering you because you're done for. Um, but we didn't go in looking for audit trails in the operating system like the thumbnail cache database, which we'll talk about in a second. We went in for something very specific. If you're looking for intellectual property and you happen to find CP, are you obligated to report it? Anybody? Yes, you must. You must always report CP. You take it back to the client and you say, you either report this or I have to. And then you help them manage that process. Because nobody wants the cops coming in raw and just taking all your stuff. Especially if you've got numerous expensive forensics boxes that now have copies of that stuff on it. Putting a fence around things, nice image. Um, yeah, the rest of the stuff we talked about is things like, if they're asking you for HIPAA, do you need to bother looking for images? Yes, sometimes you do. So things like HIPAA can be broader than other concepts. Um, PCI is very cut and dried. You're looking for things to do with credit cards and money. You don't care about the fact that there's pictures of trees on there. Um, but if you're looking at HIPAA, you've got not only data, raw data, all sorts of database formats. You've also got the images and so on. So make sure you have clear, concrete goals. That's a PA State Trooper. That's only like last year. That must have been fun explaining. Set the scope appropriately, PHI, blah, blah, blah. Yep. So tools, the tools that we use. Um, does anybody use a tool that's not up there other than the one that I refuse to say their name? You probably can figure out who that is. <coughs> Guidance. Blacklight is my favorite for OSX Forensics. They are a Mac shop. They do Mac things. They are the best tool pretty much in the toolbox for when it comes to Mac stuff. They're also real good uh, for Windows Forensics. And more importantly, their software runs on Windows boxes. These things are expensive. Windows boxes are cheap. If you do processing in the commercial world, you'll quickly come to realize that having multiple machines doing multiple things at the same time means you can get to the end faster because it takes so long to process a disk. If you can have four machines doing a piece of the processing on each of them, and I'm not talking parallel processing, I'm talking one running Blacklight, one running FTK, one with X-Ways, and one just a, a box for you to poke around on the disk, you'll get done faster, assuming you've got your setup operations. Anyways, that's operational stuff. But you'll probably end up with like multiple tools. Blacklight for Macs, FTK for PCs, X-Ways for doing technical work. X-Ways is probably the most powerful tool that we have at our disposal. You can do really cool things with it, and you can automate it. You can script it to do things. So if you're a shop that continually processes a particular type of stuff, you can build systems for doing that really quickly. If you're working for a company as an internal forensic investigator, you can have X-Ways plowing through stuff on a regular basis. You can even automate it to the point where 
the internet firewall or the internet content filter pops out an alert on one of your users. This X-Way automatically takes that alert, goes out to their computer, and automatically parses the disk looking for things that are of interest to you, and then sends you an alert if it's something that you need to pay attention to. You can do that with other tools like FTK, uh, but it's much more painful. X-Ways is like constructed by engineers for engineers, but you will probably want to get the training. Ironically, it also has the cheapest training out of all of this stuff. Blacklight's not bad, Paraben's not bad, FDK's not bad. Those other guys are really proud of their software. <coughs> They all do something different, which is why you'll end up with multiple tools, aside from the ability to parallel process. There are different layers of tools in here. Um, when it comes to the OSX type stuff, you not only need to know Blacklight, you also need to know BSD Unix. Because if you know one without the other, you're going to have a bad day. Uh, if you don't know BSD Unix and you're trying to use a Mac, then you'll probably eventually get there anyways. But some of the settings that you have to alter to use your Mac to its full potential require command line utilization. So you have to get that knowledge. For example, the search box. Anybody try, anybody get frustrated using the search box on their Mac? Find me these files. I have not found those files on your disk. Why not? I gave you a wild card. It doesn't work like Windows. It doesn't work like regular expressions. It's weird. It uses things like this, though which is why you need to know your tools, there's about a thousand different keywords, maybe more, that it will understand to make your life much easier. Go to the internet and find out more about that because it's really important when you're looking for files. <clears throat> community, uh, these are some of the favorite things I have in the community. Um, the Reddit groups for OXS and DFER are nice. Black Bag has their own forensics uh, blog type deal, chat room stuff. Um, whichever tool is your favorite, that's probably where you're going to end up. But everybody should put SANS at some point. Um, ironically, Facebook is our tool of choice for group communication with, mo with my group. Um, I don't know how we ended up there, but I know the CIA has all our files now. Which brings up an interesting question. Uh, since these things take all of your photos and upload them to the cloud for various different people, whether it's Android and Google or Apple and iTunes and so on. If you're using your phone to document stuff, be very aware that those pictures are going out of your control. Your client may not appreciate that. Um, there's still a place in this world for Instamatic cameras and things that use film or at least things that are not connected. The downside is if you lose it or drop it at that point, it's gone. So you have to take additional precautions. It's so much easier to use these. But your contract probably stipulates that you're not supposed to share that data, and you already are. Of course, the people who originated it are also sharing it, but they don't want to get into that. Uh, so with all of the noise that's out there, if you start Googling any of the technical stuff in here, you'll have a hard time finding, uh, separating the signal from the noise which is why groups are important. Talk to people, get a team together, get a group together, get people that you can rely on so that when you get stumped, you can pick up the phone and go, Bob, how does this work? And Bob can explain it to you without going, well, how much money do you got? Because that's a really lame thing to do to people. Unfortunately, we all have to make a living. Stick it to the clients, not to each other. As I said at the beginning, there's so much business out there that there's not any reason to withhold knowledge or try and keep things to yourselves, secrets, business, except O-Days. Keep O-Days to yourself. They're worth money. Um, professional certifications from these guys are useful, but not that useful. They're only useful for getting you a job in places that you won't want to work. Um, they are useful for getting you a job in places that you won't want to work, but will pay for more training. Uh, I hate corporations, um, largely because they're unfeeling, unsentimental things, but they're great for getting training money out of. Everybody should go work for some at some point. Do you guys, uh, people that are in the program here, do you come out of here with any certifications? Which? Really? 
Es. Uh, ask me about certifications at the end if you want to talk more about them, but um, nobody has asked me for a certification in I don't know how many years. Uh, but SANS, I am a huge fan of the SANS training. It's really expensive, but it's good. You can these days, of course, get lots of stuff off of YouTube, but mm, it's YouTube, come on. If, if you were going to go out and learn it, you'd have done it already, <laughs> right? Motivation comes easier in a classroom environment. I can be found on Facebook and LinkedIn. It's real easy. Um, uh, look me up if you want to communicate about stuff in the future. Blogs that we follow specifically are the pen testing blogs and the, the DFIR, DFIR, Defensive Forensics Incident Response, right? Did I get that right? Okay. The fancy word for reaction. Uh, it, it's far better to not react and get it taken care of ahead of time, but such is life. In terms of forensics and what you're doing, you're also going to need to know red team stuff and blue team stuff, but you, you're practically blue team anyways. Um, but the red team stuff you need to know because it's important to know your enemy. If you're working on a CP case, we want to give you money to work on this CP case, and you have no idea how that world operates, you're going to have a very difficult time finding things like steganography images because you won't know they're there. Uh, hopefully, if you took a class on forensics, they told you about stego, um, but it gets harder every year. The tools get better every year. They, between them and the drug dealers, uh, we have some of the most advanced anti-forensic stuff going. And if you go to the Reddit anti-forensics area, you can talk to some of those people who may or may not be willing to tell you certain strange things. Okay, enough about training and learning on this stuff. Uh, interesting areas of OSX. The whole of OS X has interesting bits. One of the neat things about this operating system and Apple layering their stuff on top of it is not only do you have the Apple stuff, um, the key databases, com dot whatever, you've also got the OS X stuff, the stuff that's from BSD Unix. Uh, and there are two different worlds, there are two different sets of logs. Although Apple has a, appropriated the syslog functionality with their own stuff, it's still basically syslog. It's the same stuff in there. Um, it is weird how they broke certain things out and put them in the user directories. But like I said, this stuff interesting everywhere in, in the OSX full file system. We're going to talk about some of it. There's no speaker notes. Why is my screen blank? So images, icons, and thumbnails is some of the stuff that you're going to deal with most commonly because that's what's most commonly dealt with. Um, especially if you're working for a government organization, the first thing that everybody gets thrown into usually is, welcome to the company. Here's a CP case. Thanks. It's just what I wanted to start working on. If you somehow manage to not um, get into that or avoid it, good for you. But the rest of us have to deal with images and thumbnails on a pretty regular basis. This machine is fantastic at dealing with this stuff. In a Windows box, you've got the log files, you've got the image, you've got the Slack space, the deleted files. You, you basically got a, a fairly set limit of stuff that they have to deal with when they want to disguise their activities. But when you've got this stuff, Apple throws stuff all over the operating system. So even if somebody looks up, how do I clean my Mac? or how do I erase files from my Mac, or how do I erase my tracks, or anything like that, anti-forensic stuff, they're not going to find it all. I mean, it's possible. I've never seen it. There's always something left with the Mac, unless, unless they're smart enough to do everything from the command line. If you do everything from the shell, and you understand how the shell tracks stuff, and how BSD tracks stuff, then it's fairly trivial to be invisible which is good to know, but at the same time, it's like, oh, man, darn it. <clears throat> but almost nobody does that, because criminals are stupid. So here's what the stuff looks like uh, when you get into the thumbnail database, which is a, did I say that? 
the Quick Look Thumbnail Cache Database, yes. Um, that's it at the bottom if you can't see it, Com Apple Quick Look Thumbnail Cache Index SQLite. It is a SQLite file. It is also keyed, which means you can't get into it unless you have the key. Enjoy that part. But it contains thumbnail images of everything that the user has looked at, not only on the GUI, like I looked at this file, but also why it's called the thumbnail cache. Um, the two drop down, um, what do you call them, the pop up bars? The most recent, it's like the most recently used list in Windows. Where you see downloads and applications. Basically, anytime Apple shows you a list of things, it builds stuff into here. It doesn't do it all the time, though. If you're going through things quickly, if you ever scrolled through your Mac and you see blank instead of pictures, it's because it can't make the thumbnails fast enough to keep up with you. But when you're doing things, it will be storing stuff in this thumbnail database, and it doesn't delete it, which is good because it rolled the syslogs when we weren't looking, and this thing is still there, so we're still OK. This can show you not only that someone looked at something as a thumbnail, it can also show you that they looked at a larger view, and in the other logs, you can see whether they looked at the entire picture. So it's very easy to reconstruct activity involving pictures on OS X, which is good because we do a lot of that. Sorry, I have to keep, uh, keep drinking. I can't I'll start croaking. Uh, metadata, stuff like that. Oh, I probably should have mentioned that at the beginning. There's a lot of stuff in OXX. Well, I think I did say there's a lot of stuff. That's why we're not covering everything in depth, because that would be a one-week training class. So you're going to need your SQLite viewers and manipulators. You're going to need something to edit plists with. Hello. You can use standalone tools. You can use uh, your forensic tools like Blacklight, which have all of this built in, and FTK um, to a greater or lesser extent. FTK sort of stumbles over some things, but even Blackbox does. Um, it depends on how fast Apple's releasing OSs and what changes they're making. But generally, those things work on all of the operating system features just fine, and it's not a problem. If you're using standalone tools, your mileage may vary, plus you may have difficulty with those in court, which is why you should be using proper tools. Oh, did I miss any? Oh, the command line here at the bottom is um, pretty cool. Let's you change the settings for uh, quick look, quick look. Uh, let's you automatically look at a file from the command line. Back to that, the command line is safer than working in the operating system. If you do this, you don't populate certain lists that you would from the GUI. So stuff is buried, and it has strange properties. The Darwin user cache, the QTS we've been talking about, is buried in a place, private var folders up here. And it has uh, the curious format of two letters and then 30 letters. And then on the current version, there's a slash C. On the previous version, there was not a slash C. Uh, there's one called ZZ, which is always the root user. That one's stable. The rest of them change, depending on the user. This stuff becomes important because as they delete user IDs on the box, those things remain constant in terms of what's in the SQL and the preview cache database. So if there's no user folder for AB, and you can map it back to log entries that are not AB, you can see they've deleted a user. There's a sans defer talk from 2015 specifically on the Quick Look database, which you should go and watch. It is just an hour long of this is the Quick Look database. It's very good. Google sans defer 2015, and it'll pop right up. The files table. Cocoa WebKit reference dates. Um, I hate this. I hate the way they do dates on this. Uh, most things, most tools convert it automatically, but if you have to do it manually, the dates are the seconds since 1-1-2001. And that is 
used to be very difficult to find that out just by Googling because the web is so vast. Um, but we're doing much better these days, uh, or Google's doing better, I'm not sure. Oh, and I've got a link for the YouTube here. So if you get this as a uh, PDF afterwards, uh, I'm sure they'll pass it out. All these links are live. So. What did I say about the DUC? Darwin user. Oh, the Darwin user cache, duh. So the Darwin user cache, um, I already said that. So I believe we have talked a little bit about this. Yeah, uh, I really can't emphasize this too much. If the system's running, do your mem dump and then take it to be imaged. If the system's not running, do not turn it on, especially the brand new Macs. The new ones this year have an even funner feature. Oh, where did I put it? And that when you lift the lid of the Mac, it automatically turns on, which is, of course, terrifying for those of us. If you're fast on the keys, you can get it not to boot the disk. But it's still one of those, you need to be prepared for this, which is why you need to talk to people. You need to keep up with the information. This one, lift the lid, no problem. New one, lift the lid, logs rotate. You're like, oh, he told us about that. Optional key to stop image. Uh, imaging view. Has anybody had to image one of the new Macs with just the USB-C port? No? That is a pure joy. You have like four dongles that have to connect together with a power input to get it to image across that link because there's only those ports. Um, it's, all, it's all on the internet now. But it's USB-C to USB-A to Thunderbolt or whatever it is you're getting it out of, but it has to be a powered adapter. It, if you have a non-powered adapter and you try this out, it may or may not copy data at all. And if it does, you better pray that that battery doesn't die while you're copying that data. So that's why we use powered ones. Back to the funny slide. The uh, lid thing was something specifically new that I learned just for this session. Uh, since I don't have a new one and I haven't had to image any yet. Which is why, of course, you need to read, because if you find it out after the fact, you're in trouble. You become a story in one of my presentations. Another problem is that there's no external indicators that the laptop is asleep, which we used to rely on to tell you that there was stuff that you needed to deal with. Um, that's about it. Some command line stuff because that's where the that's where the black art lies. The terminal is very much a love hate relationship. We love the bash history, at least I do. Uh, unfortunately, it's really easy to delete. And if you delete the bash history and then use the computer, it is gone. And there's no going back and looking for deleted bash histories. Uh, like everything else that happens at the command line level, once it's gone, it's gone. Essentially, it is possible. Um, it is uh, theoretically possible that somebody could do some stuff on the disk and then erase a whole bunch of large files and that trace would still remain out there on that further cylinder on the disk. But the likelihood of that happening is extremely rare. Just stuff in the command line doesn't happen or doesn't last, so be careful. One of the useful things about command line is that it can identify a user. If you have access to government level software, there is a tool that will pull in all of the command line activity for a user or a group of users and tell you which ones are the same person and to what confidence level, which is pretty cool stuff, kind of spooky, but it kind of makes sense. When you make mistakes using the command line, don't you make the same mistakes all the time? LS-AL or LS-LA, which isn't a mistake, but it's just a different way of doing things. Users do things differently. I make the same typos every time because my fingers work in a certain way, yours work in a certain way. 
That's how they identify us forensically based on what our typing is. Our fingers all work differently. So you will all make different mistakes. Bash history can show you that you're dealing with two users using the same user ID. If you can do those sort of comparisons. If you are looking at a directory in the OS, as opposed to in Finder, there is no record of it, other than in the syslog. Um, but there's no thumbnail cache database updates or anything like that. Of course, copying an image in Finder is going to show up and be different than in the command line. You're going to get the activity lists, different thumbnails, um, lots of stuff. If you do it in the GUI, it's lots of trace, lots and lots of trace. If you're dealing with an unsophisticated user and they're using the GUI, you're not going to have much difficulty at all. Uh, but in the command line, there's almost nothing. If you're lucky, there's a syslog entry, and if you're lucky, there's a bash history. There we go. So some of the ways that you're going to be finding uh, signs that you're dealing with criminals, especially a way to figure out that somebody knows that they're a criminal, is there's going to be files missing. So things that aren't there are almost as useful as things that are there. If they've erased their bash history, that's going to tell you that there's something there that might be worth looking at. Um, if they've erased log files, Unfortunately, if they're erased and you can't get them back, it doesn't help a whole lot, but at least gives you justification for terminating the employee. You did bad things. We don't know what it was, but we know it was bad. You're fired. Uh, no problems there. If they were doing things in the GUI, though, even if they erased the user ID thinking they were smart, those entries in the Darwin user cache the files table, things like that, will still be there. There will be an identifier. You will not be able to map it to a user ID. So you will be able to conclude that there was a user ID and that it is not there now, which may or may not be useful to your case. We've talked about some of these things. Users are billing, not billing for work that they do. So if you're trying to figure out if somebody's been doing work, they say that this person is lazy and shiftless, and you want to show that they have or have not been doing their work, what are some things that we've talked about that you can go look for? History. You can look for history, but there's no time in history. So you see all these commands, but you don't know when they were done, which is one of the downsides of Bash and one of the downsides of VI history or VI, whichever it is. Um, they're useful for telling you what somebody did, but not when they did it. But the syslog definitely will. Right? So the files can be used to show activity. Um, if a person says that they weren't doing something at a certain time, and you can see activity in the syslog, that shows that something they were doing something. It was on the command line. You don't know exactly what it was, but you know they were active and doing stuff. You can catch them in a lie. Hopefully there's more detail than that, but that may be what you get. Other items would be spreadsheets, threatening emails and Gmail, command line abuse. These things all exist. Let's see, now we get to the tricky part. Can I show stuff and get back to... Pop out of that. Okay, so far so good. I try not to do anything live in talks. Because of things like this. Oh, I know it's wrong. I thought I knew what was wrong. There we 
go. And so here's a shot of what it looks like inside of the Chrome keys of the personal directory. You've got all these wonderful files. They're all LDBs. Um, some of them have nothing in them. Some of them have stuff in them. Um, it depends on, I, I don't, don't really want to go into like what Chrome has because there's a thousand different apps. We're going to talk about how to deal with apps um, in a couple slides, but there's stuff on here for everything that's installed on the Mac, specifically for that thing. And they all have their own directory set up. If you haven't poked around on your Mac and seen this stuff, I encourage you to do so. The system level stuff is, of course, keyed. Um, I probably have all kinds of weird stuff in there because that's what I do for a living. Uh, and more important than knowing what Chrome has to show you is knowing how to deal with everything that's going to get thrown your way. Don't teach a man to no wait, don't give a man a fish, teach a man to fish. There it is. So in the case of these things here, um, filling a syslog spreadsheet, you're going to see activity in the Microsoft area if they're using Microsoft Excel, whatever application that they're using. If it's the Apple one, you're going to see you know, activity there. Um, if they send a threatening email in Gmail, you're going to see Gmail activity. You may or may not be able to pull back the original email or find cache stuff, which is another reason why Windows is so much more fun to work with. Uh, for litigation is if you compose an email in anything, any tool in Windows, where's that data? Well, you, well that, you're composing that email and sending it. Where is that data? It is in a file. The, um, I had to bring it up, didn't I? The memory file. The memory file that is called the... Oh, I hate it when my brain does this. Anyways, in Windows, it's always on that file until, it's, until it ages out. What's the memory file in Windows called? Anybody? Page file, thank you. The page file. Uh, unfortunately, Macs don't have that. So if you're composing it in Gmail and then you send it, it's gone. You have some activity. You have placeholders. Get some information out of Chrome, but not all of it. And then command line abuse, of course. Come on. <coughs> there we go. Uh, we talked about him. Um, another short example of how nosy users work. Stuff's going to show up in the activity logs and thumbnail database. These are the two areas that you're going to work with in OS X. And if it's not in there, it's not going to be anywhere else. Um, illicit movies downloaded. Another easy. Ah, I lost my speaker notes. Bear with me. Whoa, I don't know, go back. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, okay. And my speaker notes are gone. Oh, jeez. I had it set up in the beginning. We started on time. Now we're going to spend that time making me get this stuff back.
Finally, okay. Uh, pretty much covered all this. One of the neat things about um, uh, the Bash History Center. Nope. I'm not going through that again. Come on. There it is. Uh, how to find all the bash histories on the box. Usually you're going to only see the one for the users that are active. You'll notice that there's not one for root. Root does not traditionally produce a bash history unless you explicitly tell your root user to use bash. So normal use console as root will not produce this log. That's sort of important to know. So you're not thinking that they erased it. This harkens back to the first um, time we talked about different find options earlier in the presentation with the kind, colon, um, file date, file type, all the different things that you can throw in here. If you just go and look for bash history, uh, you're not going to find it. It won't find it, which is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. But that's the way they built the system. That's the way it works. You can find it from the command line. But Finder is not very useful to you. This is from inside Blacklight. It finds everything no problem. Notice, again, it only found one copy. There is no deleted. There is no backup. You only get the one copy. So if they erase it, it's gone. This is some fun stuff from inside of it. What you can expect to see when you look at it, if you've never looked at your uh, bash history before, while we're walking through here is the person doing some bad, bad things to AWS. You can see the sudo, they're VIing a file that they called bad something, which I can't produce a whole name. Um, but if, if you're a bad guy and you name your files bad, you deserve to get caught. sudo-s, the problem here now is that he's gone and done um, change to root user. We don't know what he did at that point the root user doesn't have a bash history and he didn't run a bash cell and we don't know what he did when he was there. We can look at the syslog files and figure out what he did but it's not as easy to see as what's here. They were operating on git um, which brings us to a, another fun commentary on modern computing. Don't store your key files in git. There is a google dork right now. Well there's always been a google dork but it's very popular right now to show companies all the stuff that they have in Git or in various repositories that involve their keys, their key files, um, their encryption codes, their hashes, all sorts of fun stuff. Yay, Google. And then he tried to erase his tracks. He erased the file, couldn't find the file. The file's gone because he erased it and then they used the computer. But that's your average fast shell. So some of the problems with, with using all of this data is being able to prove things. With early forensics, with, with new forensic investigators, you have a tendency to rush into the void. I have found something, and this is what it means. And you reach a conclusion before you get there. Just because you see sudo in a shell, in a bash shell, doesn't mean that they were doing bad things. I'm assuming that your users aren't supposed to be doing that. But um, there can be more to the picture than meets the eye. 
make sure you do not conclude and tell the lawyer something that doesn't make sense. Uh, if I come along on the opposite side of the table and say, well, yeah, that's what's in the past history, but in the syslog it shows that it was this, then you've just made a terrible mistake and you're going to lose this case because you're presenting material that can't be backed up with facts. Understand all of the technical capabilities of this thing and don't draw conclusions from missing data. For example, I didn't find any CP. He must have erased it. This is not consistent logically. Just because it's not there doesn't mean it was there and he acted badly. But we see things like that all the time with new people. Question everything. Uh, assumptions, most importantly, your client's statements, what they want you to find. Have standard practices. When you do stuff, for example, CP, build an operation, understand, document your operations, write this stuff out. We imaged the Mac, we did this. I'm sure that they tell you in the forensics courses, keep good notes. They also should be telling you to build standard methods so that you do the same thing every time. The consistency will make you faster, the speed will let you work more and get more done. Make sure that they're reliable methods. Every now and then you stumble upon things. That's not a reliable method. That's I got lucky and found the file I was looking for. Um, always have positive proof. Leave the conclusions to the lawyers. When you're writing your reports about this stuff, don't draw conclusions. You draw statements. You say, we found this. It indicates this. Does it prove that? That's not your problem. Your problem is to present it to the lawyer and let them deal with that part of it. On the witness stand, they will try and back you into corners on this stuff. It's lots of fun to deal with. Always remember, yes? Only in very strange and extreme circumstances. Normally all of that goes to be work product for the lawyers and is not admissible. They can, they're not even entitled to see it. Which is why you always work for a lawyer. If your buddy that owns an auto body shop comes to you and says, hey, I want you to do some forensics work. I think one of my employees is stealing. The next phrase out of your mouth would be, okay, who's your lawyer? Which he's not going to like because it's going to cost him a lot of money. But you always work through lawyers. Unless you work for the state, in which case you are the lawyer. Uh, you're just on the other side of the table, but always work for lawyers. That way your stuff's not admissible. Um, that way they are responsible, not you. You're only responsible for the work that you do. We had segue time. There was a case in Philadelphia a few years back uh, where some people in the government were embezzling money. And they were embezzling a lot of money over a lot of years. It was in excess of $50 million over the course of a decade. And there was a lot of nepotism involved. It was a very broad forensics effort. We ended up going into a building and basically seizing most of the computers in the building and doing our imaging and so on and so forth. Um, working through the lawyers, of course. One of the things that came up there when we started was do you have a warrant? Because we were working for the side of the table that needs a warrant to do things. And their response is, it's city government, we're the city government, it's in our authority to do this, just go do it. So they did it without a written warrant from a judge, which I don't know if that's legal or not, not my problem, it's a lawyer problem, but it was one of the things that came up. So if you're doing stuff that involves lawyers, it's their problem, not yours, which is another great reason for doing it. If your buddy wants you to check his employee's laptop for whatever, should you do that? No, you should not do that because you have no right to look at another person's private property. If the dean of the school brings you a student's laptop and asks you to look for stuff on it, you say, no, I do not have a right to search the other student's laptop. The same thing holds in the business world and everywhere else. Unless you have a right to do something, you can't do it. It's a crime. So don't. Um, always have lawyers. That's their job in life. Let them take the responsibility. To finish out the story, though, so they embezzled $50 million over 10 years. 
And this is why having people that are old on your team is very useful. We get down to it and we're trying to figure out how, when the manipulation of the financial started. We know that they've been changing data in the database because we have the old copy and we have the new copy. But we don't know when it began. They had changed servers from Novell a few years earlier. What do we find in a closet? Lo and behold, the Novell 2.2 server that they had been running on for like 15 years or something, and it had the original copy of most of the database, everything that hadn't been updated in 10 years, and that's when we were able to say, oh, it's been 10 years and $50 million. And we took that back to the people in the government that were responsible for making sure that those people paid for their crimes. And they said, thanks, we don't need that. We're just gonna use it to pressure some people politically and get them out of office. And so the regime in Philadelphia changed hands and nobody went to jail. And a year later, after we had warned them that you're doing things that aren't gonna be admissible in court, a year later, the feds show up. And the FBI goes in and does the exact same thing we did. They seize all the computers, they start imaging, and we heard about it and we saw it in the newspaper and we said, y'all know that's not admissible, right? And then that was the end of it. We never heard another thing about it after that. So the government intentionally screwed up a case that involved a large amount of money, tax dollars, and then walked away from it. And then they showed up again and realized that they had screwed up, but it wasn't their responsibility, so they didn't really care. I don't know. Maybe some FBI got a promotion out of it or something, but that's why you need a lawyer that understands what you're doing so that when you get into situations like that, you're not left hanging. They could just as easily have... Well, they're the ones that image the stuff, go talk to them, but nobody ever did. And they could have blamed us for corrupting the evidence, which we would have been defensible because we know with our lawyers what we can do and what we can't do. But still, nothing ever came of it. Very bummed. That was also when we figured out how to image like 100 computers in a day. back on negative proof. So we talked about this earlier. If there's no bash history file, what's the next place you're going to look at to figure out what's been going on on the computer? The system file. There might be stuff in the trash can if you're lucky. If they were using the shell for bad actions, either you've got the file and it has badness in it, you've got the file and there's no badness in it. And one of the bad things, again, about bash history is that you can edit it. So you can do bad things, go in, edit the file, save it, and there will be no evidence that you did things. I can't even tell from just looking at that that the file's been edited. But if I go back to the system logs, I can see some activity. If it's not present and it's not recoverable, it's no use. Bad guys are not super geniuses, though. If you can't find something, chances are there's still something else on that system that will tell you. If they were actually using it for what you think they were doing, it's probably a there. You might find some clues in Vim info, VI info, info, another dot file that's hidden in the operating system that you can get at from the command line. Um, like I said, if they edited it, uh, you might see stuff in here. This is the, it's actually a really large file. You'll want to look it up to get the full information on it from the manual pages. Uh, you can see it's doing stuff in here with logs. We're running stuff. It's different jumping off points. Vim info, another useful file but only if they're a command line person. If they're using the GUI, there's nothing in Vim info for you. Utility log areas, private var log ASL, private var audit. Um, this right here is a link to another presentation from 2012 that talks about some of the logs in more detail. Private var audit. All of these things are tasty morsels. And all of them pop out in your tools, so they'll be very obvious if they're there. Not bad. 
if you go and look for official documentation, you're going to find that there's not a whole lot of it. One of the problems with macOS forensics for the past whatever decades is that having documentation was almost non-existent. Up until a couple of years ago, I think there were three books, and that was it. The rest of the information had to come from Apple or people who already had answered that question. And um, I don't like to go into court with my testimony being based on somebody else's opinion. I like it to be fact-based. I like to refer always back to a manual, a document, something official that you can point at and go, see, I don't have an opinion, I have the facts. Yes? Is there any kind of Mac OS tool sets that you recommend? Mac or OS tool sets. You came in late, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, we'll come back to that. It's in there. Um, if you put in a Google search for apple.com, OSX, documentation, system, and logs, you will get to the developer's logs, or the developer's files. There's a ton of stuff in there, but it's aimed at developers. You'll end up going in there regularly to find out about new features, new things, but when you're looking at a particular log file, uh, like the Darwin user cache, that's where you're going to go to get as much information as you can uh, before checking with other forensics books. When do we get to the other part? No, a couple rows down. I should have put those in different order. Since forensics needs are frequently different, uh, different, different than the developer needs, um, they don't ask questions like, what happens when they delete the file? That's things that you're going to ask that are not in there. If you can't answer questions with documentation, you're going to have to do the research yourself. You can't just go into court and say something and go, and that's the way it is. You have to be able to prove it. The way you prove it is by doing it on the system. So you're going to need more than one Mac or more than one copy of a VM of a Mac. You're going to need a way to experiment. The fastest way to figure out what the system is doing when it does it is to do it and then go and look for changes. If you just look at, if you do something on the system and that have changed in the last minute, you're going to see a whole bunch of system stuff. Maybe you'll see the log file entries. That's going to tell you what's going on with that application when it's changed. That's how you find the stuff because it's not documented anywhere. Every case is different. Every tool is different. The last one that we worked from California with the great FBI agent was uh, involved a thing called Teddy Bear VPN. There's a ton of this garbage out there. Uh, free VPN, I mean, there's thousands of them. I used one while I was on vacation down in the Dominican Republic because Google kept trying to redirect me to the Dominican Republic, Google, and I don't speak Dominican, which is Spanish in a way, but not. Um, either way, I wasn't getting the results that I wanted. But a VPN pointed back at America, and you can set it to whatever location you want, uh, will get you into the right area. So you're going to use VPNs when you're traveling, except in China, because they'll knock on your door and ask you to leave. That's a different story. Um, but we were talking about tools. Since every tool is different and they all do different things, that's why I emphasize learning how to deal with the process because next year there'll be different tools. Yes. So the question was, is the level of documentation increasing or decreasing or staying the same? It's gotten better. It's not gotten to the point where everything I need to know is documented. Um, and when it comes to third-party apps, never, never. Uh, you're better, better, going to have better luck with Microsoft than you are with some of the third-party apps. But ironically, some of the small developers are better at debugging and keeping logs than Microsoft is. Uh, every case is different. Um, when, and when, when someone tells you that in order to figure out the case, you're going to have to install this piece of spyware off of CNET, then the whole concept of disposable systems that you can test with comes into play. One of the nice things about Macs, that again is a failure on the Windows side of things, is that you can clone this disk and use it again and again and again, and Macs and, and Apple doesn't care. So you have a clean development system. When you buy your Mac, for example, clone the disk, make a couple working copies. Disk is cheap. Disk is so cheap 
there's no excuse for not having three or four copies of your OS handy and ready to use. Plug in the USB, boot, boot off of that disk, you're now on a clean OS. I would recommend removing your disk, your production disk, or at least disconnecting it because some bad software will do things to anything it can find. Um, but having that clean copy is critical to doing OS X forensics because you're going to install something like Teddy Bear and you're not going to like what it does to your system and you're not going to be able to uninstall it. Um, so you need that copy. You don't need a whole other MacBook. They're very expensive. You just need a piece of silicon that costs $20. And then you've got a disk that you can play with and destroy and do bad things to and not feel bad. Plus, you can run comparisons between the two if you're running multiple systems. Um, you can run direct comparisons back to using X-ways and scripting. We can fire stuff up over here and then have the script run and gather the results for us. We don't have to go in and manually figure out what files changed. Let the software do the work for you. That's why we have it, because it's better than we are. Uh, software doesn't make mistakes unless you tell it to make mistakes. Or you source it from China. A point about processing cases like this. On OS X, pretty much every time you come across a question, it's going to take you about a day to resolve it. Which is good to know, but it's an awful long time. So when you're working through it and you finally come across Teddy Bear and the VPN, you have to stop what you're doing, figure out what Teddy Bear is doing, if it's part of your, your case sequence. So you've got to set up your boot drives, do all this stuff, install Teddy Bear, look at the difference, do the analysis, and write up some sort of finding. We did this, this is what it means. We did this, this is what it did. Because you're going to need that for the court and the lawyers. That's what we bill for. But it's going to take you about a day to do every question. So the further this progresses, the more expensive it gets for the lawyers. That's why coming back to the, what we talked about in the beginning with scoping is so important. Flying blind, going in black box on these things and not knowing what you're looking for means you cannot tell the lawyer how much it's going to cost which is fine when the client is a Fortune 500 company because they have bottomless pits of money. But it's very bad when it's the local Allentown DA and he's only got a budget of five grand for you. You're going to burn through it just figuring out that you have to ask a question that you don't have an answer to. So those fencing, that um, scoping becomes very important when it comes to third party software. What we're building here with the different layers is a mosaic of evidence. We've got the operating system stuff, which is great. Syslog is your friend. We've got the stuff that the GUI is giving us from the duck, which is your friend. And between the two of those, if they haven't erased everything, you can build a pretty complete picture of everything that's happened on that machine. Ah, and this is what I just talked about. Cool. The simplest way to find out what the app is doing when it does its thing is to run it and just look for the recent changes in the time frame that you used it. That shows you not only what the app did, it shows you what the system did. So when you fire up Teddy Bear and it goes out and pings servers in Russia and China and Vietnam and Canada, all of that will become readily apparent. Here is an example of one of the things that we did. All I did was open Safari and shut it down, and it changed the history file times. Did I have that right? Did I circle the wrong one? No, one of them's different. Local storage? Local storage. I meant to move. <laughs> the red circle should be down here on local storage. <laughs> so here we got 23, 17, 43, 20, 16, 23. So I fired up and it changed that, we would go there and look. Yay, command line. Uh, some resources to read. These are things that I keep referencing on a regular basis, even though some of them are very old. This one, Computational Forensics, Digital Crime and Investigation, is available in Google Library, which means you don't actually have to pay for it. So that one's good. Uh, different websites for various things. Um, TheForensicsWiki.org is really nice and I'm sure would welcome your contributions to it. It's one of the central sites for looking up forensics material. I'm doing this. Where do I look for answers? I'm going there. 
then there's goofy stuff in Mac 4 and 6. Get it? 4 and 6. Uh, uh, those are good website references. There's different feeds from trainers, from uh, manufacturers. And then there's forums of strangeness like sbinnovation.de. They have one answer to one specific question that I had to work on for the case. So I went and I looked at it. The problem with, again, looking for answers with Google is that you're going to get sent to the Ukraine sooner or later. And what happens when you go to the Ukraine? <coughs> you become a botnet. You become a node in the botnet. Which brings us to how you go about doing all of this stuff and operating. Um, Ed Scudis is a fellow at SANS, very smart guy. And he has this uh, saying called hack naked. That comes about because when you're doing your red team stuff, in particular when you're doing port scanning and so on, when you're sniffing, uh, when you're trying to do things that involve the network, if you have any form of filtering between you and the target, you are not going to get the true picture. So you have to shut off your antivirus, your firewall, all that kind of garbage, and you have to know if your ISP is blocking anything. Almost all ISPs block something. Very hard to find pure data now. If yours don't, the ones at the other end probably do. So you can't throw Christmas tree packets across the network anymore like you used to because it gets dropped. Fragmented packets get dropped. Every router in between can see it's a fragmented packet. Why would it pass it on? Coming back to the VPN, uh, the VPN of choice for a lot of this stuff is Netcat if you have access to the client network. Uh, anybody use Netcat? Yay, Netcat. Uh, very simple program, very elegant. It's still in use after 20 20 years? It's all it does is throw up a pipe, wonderful thing. Um, but it passes everything, including broken packets. The opposite of that is when you're doing your forensic stuff, like when you're going and looking at the forensics wiki and you end up in the Ukraine, never surf naked, you always surf in armor. Better yet, do your surfing on a throwaway system that you don't have to worry about. Have an old piece of junk Pentium in the corner that you can run off of a booted version of Linux and use that to go do research. That way you can go and look at all of the Russian sites and the Ukraine sites and the Chinese sites and you don't have to worry about screwing up your lab. Uh, there's a lot of bad stuff out there and it works very fast. Hey, thank you. Come on. What? I don't know why it's losing the mouse every now and then. Oh, that is the last slide. I didn't even have the last slide on here that says, yay, thanks for attending, and so on. Um, so we have ample time for questions. We're supposed to go to three. I will come back to the beginning for you guys after I answer questions. Yes? I just use the disk utility on Mac. Well, actually, I cheat. Get apart and put a bigger one in anyways. So since I have it out of the box and we have all of the hardware to deal with M.2 drives and things like that, um, but yeah, the, the stuff that's built in works fine. DCFLD, use Linux. <coughs> Others? Pardon? Uh, a lot. It depends on which P list you're looking at. Unfortunately, it depends on the application. It depends on the aspect of the OS that you're looking at. But in general, all of the user activity will be exposed for whatever it is that they're doing. Applications are going to be less likely or have more potential to be, have gaps. But the OS is going to contain pretty much everything. 
you can look at, you can tell not only that they looked at a picture, you can tell whether they looked at the thumbnail, whether they looked at a larger view of it, whether they looked at it in preview, if they looked at it in a specific application, all of that stuff will be detailed in either the doc or in the plist. No. Yep. Now some of the plist stuff does go away. Some things it only keeps like the current instance of, but other things it's a log. And you'll have like, like the doc the, or the, the image database. It's just a continually expanding log of stuff. Louder? I don't know if there's a format limit to any of them. There's different types, and some of them probably have a limitation. But the ones that are SQLite tables, no. Theoretically, there's not. But a lot of the stuff just doesn't keep entries. Poke around, go look at them. Difficulties that we've encountered in the process with OSX include things like the P lists and determining what it is you're looking at because of the lack of documentation for specific aspects of it. So I might be able to get documentation out of Apple that says, yes, this feature produces this P list, like Safari and uh, history list or something like that, but I can't find documentation about details in it. I might not be able to figure out what the codes in the fields are. Like, for example, the directory structure that we use to get at the um, history database with the XX and then the 30 digits or the 30 alphanumerics, there's no documentation on why that is what it is. It's just random. But we know that ZZ is root. And the rest of them seem to go in sequence AA, AB, AC, AD, like that. So that nice two-digit one is predictable and, and fairly easy. So if you look at the system and you've got ZZ and BF, you know there's been a lot of users erased on that machine. But when it comes to the 30-digit, I think that's just random. And then when it comes to other things that the OS does, there may or may not be information available, and you get to build time figuring out why it is or ask questions from the community as to why it is. And people specialize in this stuff. I'm a generalist, so my take on a lot of this is fairly shallow. Uh, and the people that do specific presentations on individual topics, which is what all you are going to do, right? Come back in a couple of years or next year and do a presentation on a specific aspect of it that nobody else has done. Because that's a great job resume item. I did this, and it's gotten 4,000 hits on YouTube, which for the forensics community is a big deal. If everybody's looked at your video, then you did something right. Um, and we need more of it. And one of the problems, again, with the community and with the field in general is that things change so fast. There's always material that needs to be looked at. There's always information that you can be sharing and discovering. So you've got the employment opportunities. You've got the ability to use this stuff to your advantage. You just have to go do it. Um, we could spend a countless amount of time on almost anything. You could do an entire two-hour presentation just on the P-lists and the various problems with those. And you still wouldn't get into all of them. Um, but that would be looked at very favorably and get you um, probably a job. More so than being in the chess club, that's for sure. Yes? Blacklight. <laughs> I got Blacklight. I'm not sure if I have my other P-List tool on this computer. Let's see. Oops. Shut that down. What's it? Yes. You can get a trial edition, I believe, um, but it is a four-fee application. It's not terribly cheap. It's not terribly expensive either. It's less than... In order of purchasing power, your number one opportunity is X-Ways, which I think does P-Lists now. Uh, X-Ways is fairly inexpensive. I'm going to say less than 1,000, might be 1,000. And Blacklight is about 2,200. 
and then FTK is about 2,800, and then there's that other garbage utility that's very expensive, like four grand. Um, and FTK also has the cheapest education materials. It's only 800 bucks. So for the price, for less than you'll pay for FTK, you can get X-ways and training. Uh, and there's some material out there available. Yes. I don't know. There's lots of information about did this particular Mac connect to that particular phone? That's easy. But details about things that they did and information that they shared, um, like for example, if you've got Clash of Clans on your phone and you connect it to, and this has a connection to the internet. Does Clash of Clans send any data at that point? I don't know. No one's. Ever, I don't know if anybody's ever looked at that. But that's going to be the same for every single application. We know the phone sends stuff, but I have never gone looking for the specifics in that. Other than was this phone connected to that, computer, and were there files on this phone that wound up on this computer or that they viewed? That's the extent of my involvement with that piece. Love the PLS. Uh, PLS files, I mean, XML files that are key value for repairs. Yeah, it's just tedious. There's freeware utilities, and it's built into the operators. Uh, if, if that's what you're after in terms of why are, are, are there inexpensive tools, there's plenty of free tools out there. Um, oh, that's what I was coming to look for when we do, 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 do. Do I have it? Yeah, I use PList Edit Pro. Oops, I guess we're going to have to look at it. A new version is available. And it's, yeah, it's just an XML markup thing, so it's pretty pump. Are forensic tools or Do for, you, you ask, do forensic, do these forensics tools look at Apple's new file system? Yes, they do. Oh, I know why you're asking that. Yeah, that thing's a pain in the butt sometimes. I'm not a fan, but I, that's dealing with it at the OS level. Dealing with it at forensics level, it's just another disk source. We come across encrypted systems all the time. How do you decrypt them? You don't. You get the key. If they won't give you the key, they go to jail. That's the only way in. I'm not sure what you're asking. If it, there's two reasons you're looking at an encrypted file system. One, the owner wants you to look at it, in which case they are entitled to the key, and they can compel the user to give them the key and then give it to you, or you are a criminal investigator, and the perpetrator does not want to give you the key, and you can currently compel them to give, them, give you the key, or at least make them very uncomfortable so that they will give you the key. Uh, but there are, there's two guys in jail right now that refuse to cough up the keys. They're in jail. They're not in jail because they committed a crime. They're in jail because they refused to give up the keys. Yes, because the court is looking at you for some particular reason. They don't care about the intellectual property. It could be the secret to coke. Um, the secret ingredients in Coke, and he still has to give up the key, and that's Coke's problem. They can have a lawyer present if it comes down to that. Um, there is some interesting case activity on that because what's in the system becomes legal, and may, may be relevant to the case, uh, especially if they were moving that secret to China for production. 
that was the guy's crime was about the intellectual property. Uh, those cases, that was weird. Well, I've never seen one of those. There's an operating system that requires multiple people to decrypt. Okay, that's an application, a specific application that, that's a feature of that app. That's not the OS. Are you talking about their individual directories? No. Oh, the boot feature. Oh. Uh, Yeah. Mm -hmm. It hasn't come up in any of our cases yet, but I would think that when you give me your key because you're being compelled, it will not decrypt the information on the computer that you're using uh, with your key. I would think, but I haven't looked at it. But the OS will let you get at the other portions of the disk even if you didn't put in the other person's key? Thanks, Apple. Cool. I don't know. We get these things and we say it's encrypted and give us the key and they give us the key and that's pretty much our limit. The technical details of how the thing works, that's great for people that are working in that specific field, but for most of us, we don't need to know that sort of thing. That's almost like getting into the math aspects of it, is how does the encryption work, the different pieces. You'll never have to explain that in court. Not at that level. Something's gone drastically wrong if that's happening. Any others? Okay, so back to your list about the tools. Uh, Where did I put it? There's this one. SQL Live viewers, PLIST viewers, uh, that's areas of the OS. And your tools, tools, there it is. Blacklight, FTK, X-Ways, Paraben, and Guidance. Um, there's a cool thing called OS Collector. There's the open source stuff from SANS and a variety of other places. No, no, I think I send those to, um, uh, what's his face, Paul? Uh, I send those to the conference organizer after this. Since it was being changed up until the moment I gave the presentation, he doesn't have a, a working copy, but he will after this, and then that will go out to the website and be downloadable. All weeks are hot. That would be a good combo presentation for next year with the multiple user access file system and a lawyer. If you could get a lawyer to make some statements about that, I'd be real interested. That's it. I can tell more war stories. More horror stories. All right, no problem. Welcome.